Hello, everyone. My name's Keith. Hi, my name's Andy, and welcome to Brockton Bay. Welcome to the very first episode of the Brockton Bay Chronicles, reviewing Worm by Wildbow. This is the podcast where two old college friends read and discuss the web serial Worm by John C. McRae. Andy is reading Worm for the first time. He'll be giving us his thoughts and impressions along the way. I've read Worm, and I'll be acting as faithful Sherpa, helping guide the discussions without giving any spoilers. Andy, what, uh, what are we covering today? Well, we're going to be looking at arc one today, Jeff Station. All right. Looking forward to going through that. Uh, we have any new business today? Probably not, since this is our first podcast. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, no new business today. Um, and since it is our first podcast, uh, we would appreciate the audience take it easy on us, uh, give us a little leeway. We're still figuring things out here. Uh, we're relatively technically adept, but, uh, you know, not used to being behind a microphone, that's for sure. Absolutely, buddy. So um, before we dive into the meat of this thing, uh, I guess we should let folks know how we, uh, how we each came to Worm a little bit. Uh, I had my, uh, my oldest son tell me about this thing. He'd been after me for literally two years to, to, uh, to check out Worm. He was pretty enthusiastic and by the time I finally started it, uh, my only regret was that I didn't listen to him sooner. And uh, and Andy, um, I know I kind of drug you to this rodeo, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, just like old times. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you had mentioned it to me a couple of times. And uh, as usual, I was reading a bunch of different books at the same time and didn't really find time to squeeze it in. But uh, finally took a look at it and uh yeah immediately got hooked so i'm chomping at the bit uh i would have liked to just blow through the whole thing but uh we're following this format and uh so i'm trying to come at it with a a fresh set of eyes and uh so we can kind of have this back and forth here so yeah absolutely uh i'm looking forward to that and as i told you you know i several times during this thing i'd wanted to stop and re uh, start again because I was just really enjoying the story and uh, I'm really happy that we're going to be able to find time to uh, to get together and and discuss this thing in detail so and uh, with that being said what do you say uh, we dive on into this thing huh let's do it okay we're going to do our point by point now starting with arc one chapter one and in this chapter uh, we meet our protagonist Taylor She's sitting in her world's issues class, so uh, waiting for lunch to begin. And um, yeah, we as she goes through describing her situation, and it's, uh, she's not really fond of her teacher there. And um, she goes out and uh, goes to lunch. And at that point, we find out she's the victim of some pretty, pretty vicious uh, bullying, wouldn't you say, Andy? Yeah, no doubt. Um... I mean, I've I've been through some of that. Uh, nothing nothing to this extent, for sure, though. Um, and as as you uh, mentioned, you know, it's it's these these three other girls that are kind of ganging up on her, and and one of them she had a significant relationship with. That's correct. Uh, we find out that her tormentors are uh, Madison, Sophia, and Emma. And Emma used to be Taylor's uh, best friend, but um, we don't know what happened. Uh, shortly, uh, Taylor reveals to us that, uh, that uh, shortly before they began high school, something changed in their relationship. Yeah, and, and that's, that's really tough. And I think it's, it's really interesting the way, you know, the author hooked me in, even at this beginning point, without there being any kind of... Uh, science fiction superhero stuff going on yet uh i think that's a testament to his writing abilities that uh what starts out is kind of like uh a young adult fiction book uh, right. you know with teen drama i was still like oh wow what's gonna happen um, yeah definitely relatable i agree i agree with that point a lot um especially uh you know knowing what 
uh, knowing Tony's taste and, and things, I, uh, I thought I w- knew what this was going to be like. And I was glad to see that I was completely wrong and, and had my expectations subverted. So uh, Taylor's bullying has led to her having a pretty uh, lonely life uh, in, as a high schooler. And to the point where she's, um, she, she, as she leaves her class, she goes to have her lunch and she's, we find out she's been enjoying, well, I wouldn't use that word really. Sure. She's been uh, suffering to the point where she's, for lunches, she'd spend it in the restrooms. And that's where we see this first bullying attack. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty brutal. Um, I mean, I've, I've had times in my life where my best friend's um, and I have, have become disconnected, but it's always been, you know, legitimate reasons. It's never been something like this. Um, but it's still hard. And so I can't imagine how much harder it is when it's somebody's feel like you've been kind of betrayed and then to have them bully you like this on top of it, uh, would be, would be super difficult to deal with. Agreed. Agreed. And so, uh, as these girls pour juice on her and, uh, and, basically a meliator with juice and uh, soft drinks, pouring them on her as she's trapped in the stall. After a few minutes, they leave her. And here we have our first bit of a display of Taylor's power. And I've got this section from the, from the web serial. I want to read through real quick just to bring this into the conversation. So this is uh, Taylor's description of what she was feeling at the moment where we see her display her powers for the first time. I shut my eyes and felt buzzing crystallize into concrete information. As numerous as the stars in the night sky, tiny knots of intricate data filled the area around me. I could focus on each one in turn, pick out details. The clusters of data had been reflexively drifting towards me since I was first splashed in the face. They responded to my subconscious thoughts and emotions as much as a reflection of my frustration and my anger my hatred for those three girls as the pounding in my heart and trembling hands were. I could make them stop or direct them to move almost without thinking about it, the same way I could raise an arm or twitch a finger. I opened my eyes. I could feel adrenaline thrumming through my body, blood coursing in my veins. I shivered in response to the chilled soft drinks and juices the trio had poured over me. With anticipation and just a little fear, On every surface in a bathroom were bugs, flies, ants, spiders, centipedes, millipedes, earwigs, beetles, wasps, and bees. That's a heck of an introduction to uh, to Taylor's uh, power set there, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I was really surprised at that. I didn't know where it was going with the information. Um, And then, yeah, to just have them you know, trying to picture in my mind what it would look like with the, <laughs> the surfaces there covered with bugs. All of a sudden, that was pretty a uh, pretty vivid picture that he painted there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, the first time I read that, uh, you know, I'm with you about the uh, the knots of information. He's he's Wild Bo is is I won't I don't want to say vague, but he entices us. I guess you could say with just enough information, you're like, well, what is this buzzing at her consciousness? What is this information that she's, she's, she's uh, feeling? Uh, and I also like how in his description, it's almost like, um, how do you put it? Um, sh- how she could make each, make this horde of insects that could make, direct them and without thinking about it, almost like a uh, twitching a finger or raising an arm that's uh that's pretty instinctual or or pr- would instinctual be the correct way to phrase it or or uh you know she's doing it without even really thinking about it yeah yeah it's it's like become an extension of herself kind of it's like integrated almost thank you yeah um and uh and yeah you know later on uh we'll learn some more about that but uh it's still um it was, it was kind of, uh, looking back on it, shocking how quickly the gears shifted, but it was pretty seamless while I was reading it. It didn't seem, you know, like it was like, whoa, all of a sudden, you know, cut away to some wild other scene or whatever. It, uh, I was surprised at the end result, but it, it just led into it pretty seamlessly, I thought. Interesting. Yeah. 
And then uh, Taylor, as she's trying to talk herself off the ledge, metaphorically speaking, she, she mentions how she could, she thinks about going carry, if you will, on the school and uh, decides against it because that would be against her plan because she is going to be a superhero. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. Um, I wondered how many people would actually get the going carry reference. Um, but but yeah. there's a remake of that, right? So <laughs> I always think of the old uh, Sissy Spacek version from back in the day. And I thought, yeah. man, most people, Tony never saw that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then I thought, wait, they did make a remake. So yeah, they've um, tried a couple times, but uh but but yeah, it's interesting that that Wild Bull did pull out that particular reference. But for those of us who are old enough, we we get it and it makes sense and the imagery is pretty good. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, especially with the kind of blood getting dumped on Carrie versus the right. juices getting dumped on uh, Taylor. So yeah, yeah. So so Taylor um, manages to, to to calm herself and she disperses the insects and um she decides that it's not worth trying to uh to go on to her classes for the rest of the afternoon and she decides to catch the bus home and so in uh we're on to arc one chapter two taylor skips her afternoon classes um we find out that she's actually only had her powers uh for three months this is all new to her yeah, that's pretty uh, pretty amazing that she's got that kind of control in that short of time. And you know, it's it's interesting that she's she's got this plan to be a superhero. So that gives you a little inkling that there's others out there, um, but you don't know anything about that yet or what that uh, ecosystem might be like and where she would fit in. So uh, definitely builds the anticipation. Yes, indeed. And uh, so once she gets home, she she goes through, uh, or excuse me, let me back up a second. On her bus ride home, she laments the loss of her uh, of her backpack. And in her backpack was a couple of school assignments, uh, books, and her superhero diary, where she was taking down notes, uh, making plans, uh, designs for her costume, her would-be costume, and so forth and so on. So she, she really, uh, really lamented that. She has been training. Once she uh, once she got her powers and began to understand what they were, uh, we find out she's been training, um, and it seemed like she she took this pretty seriously, wouldn't you say? Oh, for sure, yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's interesting that uh, she's kind of taken this positive tack. I mean. I think if I were in that position uh, of being bullied um, and there was this kind of, there was some kind of superhero type stuff. Um, I mean, I have, I have what might can be called an epic temper at times. And so <laughs> uh, I don't know that I would have been able to have that restraint, especially in high school. Um, so it's pretty cool that she has that, but also I think it's cool that uh, the author uh, as a as a man is able to kind of paint a picture that seems very believable or uh, you could definitely see it in a, a girl early in high school going through this. No, that's an interesting point. Yeah. No, I never considered it from that point of view. I do like uh, this, this one section uh, of a story, this quote here, three months ago after I'd recovered from the manifestations of my powers, I started to prepare for the goal I set for myself. I had involved, or excuse me, it had involved an exercise routine, training my powers, researching, and preparing my costume. So, yeah, this young lady seems seems pretty driven early on. Definitely, yeah, yeah, and it's it's interesting. You know, you never know how somebody's going to respond to trauma, um, right? But uh, but she's definitely uh, seems like she's on the right the right track in spite of all the uh, obstacles that have been kind of thrown in her way. Agreed. And so she's actually begun uh, making herself a spider silk costume. And I really, I mean, you, you know, given what I do professionally, you know, being involved in manufacturing, you know, let's just say that broadly speaking, um, I was kind of in awe at 
how well he laid out what she did with the spiders and how she was handling them and and uh, basically the animal husbandry if you will I, I hope that's i hope that's the correct word the correct yeah. use of that word as far as um she got herself some spiders she knew well, she knew which kind she wanted to use black widow spiders and she started constructing a uh, a suit and she managed the resources you know keeping them fed rotating freshly uh our fresh spiders in to, to to weave silk for her i'd say that was pretty good on her part Oh, for sure. I think it goes to her level of uh, integration with the creatures that she she knows that they're territorial, so she can't pack them all in one oh, yeah. box. And, you know, that they only have so much so they can pump out, uh, that they tend to lay their eggs seasonally, and she's got to kind of trick them into thinking, mm-hmm. okay, now's a good time. And then she's got to provide enough food for the the young that get hatched out so um it reminded me of uh, back in the day when you and i played dungeons and dragons you know we never yeah. thought about like in a dungeon that it was weird that this pack of monsters is right next door to this pack of monsters. yeah, yeah no, why no. aren't they eating each other or why aren't they <laughs> fighting with each other and, and but the author and this girl um in the story has thought of all that and yeah and i think it really shows how in tune she is with the, the uh, minions if you will yeah, agreed. Um, so she makes a pretty a pretty uh, big decision. She decides that that this um, this incident in the restroom has been basically going to use that as an impetus for her to stop stalling and to go out in costume for the first time. And I got a, this uh, this one quote here I like. I was constantly planning and preparing, considering all the possibilities. There would always be more preparation, more stuff, more stuff to study or test. The destruction of my notebook had been the burning of a bridge. I couldn't go back, copy it into a fresh book, or start a new one without delaying my game plan for at least a week. I had to move forward. It was time to do it. I flexed my hand inside the glove. I'd go out next week. No, no more delays. This weekend, I would be ready. So Taylor has uh, set for herself, said it's time to stop, uh, to stop stalling and to go out and, you know, try to be a hero. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty impressive. Um, I mean, I definitely am more uh, prone to the analysis paralysis, if you will. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would have, yeah, copied it all down, made it better the next time, made a backup copy, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But, uh, you know, she just she just moves forward with it. Now, I I wasn't prepared for, you know, what happened next. I thought, you know, along the lines of like Spider-Man, where maybe he encounters a mugger in an alley or something. Um, Yeah. So this uh, next part was uh, quite a surprise. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, yeah, chapters three and four are where things definitely, definitely get going. So she uh, Taylor decides to to work her way in toward the uh, the side of town called the docks. And that's uh, definitely the seedier side of the area. And she goes out and picks herself a fight with a gang called the ABB or more commonly referred to as the Asian bad boys. Um, they for the most part, the group is, uh, you know, regular civilian type folks, but their leader lung is a pretty bad dude, isn't he? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely, uh, expands on that as it, as it goes forward, but even the, the part that's known about him that she's researched, uh, shows that he's, he's going to be a lot to handle. Um, I thought it was also interesting the picture the author painted of, uh, how you can kind of have that boardwalk ritzy veneer, um, but it's very thin. And all you mm. do is you, you move like one street off the, the nice part of town and all of a sudden you're in the bad part of town. Yeah. Um, growing up, I always thought it was much more, there'd be like a buffer thing or whatever. But sure. since I've lived in my life, it can be that. Where uh, the, the line of demarcation is pretty thin, huh? Oh, yeah. You flip the switch and all of a sudden you're like, oh, my gosh, how this doesn't I don't want to be here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I thought that was very realistic the way he 
portrayed that. Yeah. So Taylor, Taylor, as she's approaching, she's, I liked this part where she, you know, as she's going into the, uh, into the dock, she's gathering a swarm and uh, she, she stumbles upon the, uh, the ABB as they're discussing their plans to quote unquote, kill kids. Taylor thinks that uh, they're talking about killing children and it's not quite that, is it? We don't find out till later, but uh, it's not uh, the kids that uh, that Lung is speaking of aren't really children. Right. Yeah, that's that's a great point. But I think the author had to use something um, really morally or ethically uh, a, a big push, right? Because yes. this is her first time out, right? And unless it was something really bad, she's probably going to hang back and maybe use the bugs as reconnaissance, or you know, I wasn't sure what. Um, but this, because she she knows this guy Lung is a heavy hitter. Um, I think she it mentions that he's gone up against some of the big folks in town. Uh, Correct. The big heroes, and and he's never been caught. Uh, so. She knows he's uh, he's a force to be reckoned with. Um, That's a good so, point. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just don't think she would dive right in unless she had heard something like kids were in danger. Yes, that's that's what I was I was going to agree with you on. Definitely, um, you know, Wild Bo, she has to have some some impetus to make her make the decision to charge a guy or attack a guy, a group of guys, a, a superpowered being, a cape who she's, as you said, she's researched on, and he sounds like a bad dude. And of course, you know, there'd be a wiki for 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 capes, wouldn't there? I mean, <laughs> I think they even talk about, uh, sometimes there's questions about whether the information on the, the, the cape wiki, if people are putting up misleading information about, uh, about their capabilities. Yeah, um, you know, and, and that, you know, spun my mind off into a whole nother thing. You know, I mean, I've gotten caught up in, uh, you know, like the Marvel universe, reading the the wikis that people have built, and it's oh, all yeah. it's all just you know fictional stuff. So trying to imagine what it'd be like as a high school kid when there were actual superheroes going around, I don't know if I ever would have gotten out of high school. I would have been <laughs> the whole time reading the wikis or sure. trying to add to stuff or investigating stuff or it would have been a never ending rabbit hole. So uh, pretty cool to think about that. So Taylor sends her swarm in to attack the ABB, uh, the non-powered guys she dispatches pretty easily. And initially uh, all it see, all her attacks seem to do to lung is piss him off. And, uh, and he starts to turn pretty monstrous as he gets uh, as he gets angrier. Yeah, his uh, power up, if you will, from uh, video game terminology is is pretty uh, pretty impressive. And uh, you know, it talks about how pretty much anybody else you fight at some point starts to weaken, but he just seems to keep getting stronger. And and there's no known limit to how strong or how buffed out he can get and so uh i'm just picturing this uh as she describes it kind of a waif of a thing uh you know early in high school mm, mm -hmm. um you know facing this uh known criminal uh killer uh that just keeps getting bigger and, and meaner and madder um it's just kind of amazing, but she, she knows that she's got to try to protect whatever kids she thinks are in danger. So she just hangs in there. Yeah. And, and she seems to be holding her own initially. As a matter of fact, uh, she, we go to this one section where she's talking about uh, how she's uh, specifically sending what, what insects to attack lung. And I've got this one quote here. Um, it does. This is the first time, I guess, we kind of raise an eyebrow at her. But uh, the quote goes, um, "I felt a sadistic glee as I organized the attack on Lung. I directed flying insects to attack his face. With distaste, I, for I focused the crawling ants and spiders on other vulnerable areas." So uh, Taylor, you know, a sadistic glee. I mean, you know, okay. Uh, I guess you could call it bloodlust, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, I think 
um, you know, when all, any of us are faced with injustice or uh, things that go against what we believe in, um, we have a desire to try to uh, right the wrong. And uh, I think that combined with her holding back when she was personally attacked and and kind of keeping that um, under wraps, I think you've got that kind of double push now to like, all right, well, now I can let loose. This is nobody's yeah. going to fault me for taking this guy down. So this this guy's this guy's a bad guy, and and yeah. So what if we, you know, if I hurt him a little bit? Yeah, good point. So she's getting the better of him initially, and uh, then things go sideways as uh, as Lung continues to power up, as you say, to the point where she. I got worried. I'm like, you know, this girl's going to get, get fried here. Um, so as we move on to, uh, move on to chapter five, um, Taylor essentially has her life saved by a group of, uh, super villains. Yeah. That was a, a twist. I wasn't expecting. I thought that was really well done by the author. Um, just going back for a second on the kind of the wiki topic. Yeah, it's interesting that Lung takes care of the bugs with something that people didn't know he could do. Um, basically, lighting himself on fire but not burning. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's that's an interesting twist there. It also reminded me of something from a movie where uh, she's talking about sending him to basically his private parts, uh, sending the 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 bad bugs there, and. Uh, the, the movie talked about was a guy was talking about where he concealed weapons about himself and how he always put one in that area of his uh, clothing because men were very unlikely to pat somebody down there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you'd almost always. And so I wondered well, how much fire is long, how, how confident uh -huh. is he in his powers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't light anything on fire down there. That's yeah. Um, so uh, I thought that was interesting that the wiki didn't cover that. And then you wonder, you know, well, how, how thorough was Lung's explanation yeah. of the bugs? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just got the impression that, you know, he, he went, you know, human torch, if you will. So uh, yeah, you're and, probably and, right. and that wiped out everything. So as Taylor is about to, you know, thinking that Lung, you know, she's on top of this building. Lung climbs to the top of the building is about to shoot fire at her and wipe her out when suddenly lung is attacked by this big ferocious creature two more of the creatures land on top of the building uh, the first one knocks lung to the street if i'm not mistaken and a couple of riders dismount from each of the other two creatures and um, this is our first meeting with uh, who we find out are Tattletail, Gru, Bitch, and uh, Regent. And these, we find out, were the children Lung was talking about attacking. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big twist right there. Um, uh, which, you know, I think is a great way to... Uh, I, I think it would be very easy with all the superhero stuff out there for an author to kind of fall into familiar patterns. Sure. And and this seems like a, a, a spot where he came up with a great mechanism to go off in a totally different direction. Um, so I thought that was really cool and uh, further drew me into the whole thing. Right. Because, like you said, he used the, 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 the possibility of children being attacked as a tool to get her into this fight. And then. Uh, we have, we are again subverted by the realization that the kids were not kids, just uh, what we find out are young teenagers, uh, as we think they are, uh, about her age, roughly. And um, these were the kids that Lung was talking about. Let's see here. Um, yeah, actually, one of them approaches her, and he says they have this exchange. Um, you really saved us a lot of trouble he told me his voice was deep and masculine but muffled by the helmet he wore uh this uh character actually we come to learn his name is Gru, 
And um, his costume isn't particularly, you know, over stylish. It's based, as Taylor says, it's basically motorcycle leathers with the uh, with the helmet uh, with the skull on it on the visor. So we don't really see the, that referencing necessarily his ability. Right. Yeah. You don't know anything about the abilities other than there's these giant animals jumping around. Um, but uh, I thought it was interesting, too, that, you know, she she has to pivot mentally from, oh, I'm saving kids to, oh, I'm in the middle of a turf war between a bunch of villains. Yes. Uh, this is a drag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. This is not exactly what she uh, what she was expecting. Right. Um, yeah. So. Gru does the introduction, so uh, introduces Tattletail, says his name is Gru, the girl with the dogs, and that's when we first find out, I believe, that the creatures attacking Lung are dogs, and she she goes by bitch, but we find out the, the later on in the story, we do find out that the uh, the good guys call her Hellhound, but she, she actually prefers bitch. <laughs> And then the final member of their team is Regent. That's that group that we get to meet. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, there's there's definitely that kind of like you said, teenager vibe. You know, they're kind of joking around with each other, and uh, you know, uh, kind of backhanded uh, jibes between Brew and Regent. So yes, um, you you get that feeling that okay, well. A, a big burly villain probably would call these annoying kids or whatever. So right. that's, that kind of ties it together there. And uh, uh, suddenly um, Tattletales informs the group that there's a good guy coming and that they should probably skedaddle. And so uh, as we move on into, into chapter six, uh, this group of kids do offer offer Taylor a ride, but she decides that she's not going to leave. She decides to stick around. And when the, uh, the superhero arrives, we get our first meet of uh, Arms Master. Now, this guy sounded pretty cool. He comes rolling up on what I imagined first to be some kind of uh, Judge Dredd uh, uh, bike, nice, uh, yeah. you know, uses his halberd to, to, you know, pull himself up onto the roof. You know, his first words to her are, are you going to fight me? That would, that would startle me, scare me a little bit. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the dilemma that uh, Taylor was put in by being asked to flee with the villains. Um, it's like, well, yeah, I want to get away from Lung. I don't know what's happening down there. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen if I hang around here, but I don't really want to run with the bad guys right now either. So uh, that's a really tough spot. And again, it just the mess that she's kind of gotten herself into just keeps getting messier. Um, they're changing from just a little encounter in an alley to all of a sudden being in the middle of, you know, a superhero and two different supervillain groups. Yeah. It's yeah. Kind of wild. And so um, as, as uh, Arms Master approaches her, uh, they talk and she ends up relaying to him uh, what went down in the, uh, in the battle and how she, you know, that whole mistaken identity thing and then uh, relays to him her, the information that she discovered on the, uh, the group that she just encountered. Um, he talks to her about uh, their frustration, the good guy's frustration with not being able to... Uh, to pin these guys down they really don't know much about uh about the group as a whole and they're you know they've encountered them a couple times but again they're 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 not having any success uh trying to trying to to nab them and, and bring them to justice so to speak yeah and it uh it's there's a couple interesting things there where um as he's kind of soft interrogating taylor he implies that he can separate truth from fiction. Uh -huh. And so you don't know if that's like one of his powers or if he's just good at reading people. I mean, she's in a costume, so I don't know how much he could read from her, but um, so I'm guessing it's a power that he has, but he recognizes that, yeah, she's not, she's not a villain. Um, and uh, 
then also the the fact that Telltale knew that somebody was coming, and and so she's got some kind of psionic powers or telepathy or something. She can, and she she detected some stuff about Taylor as well about her being shy, and that's why she uh-huh. couldn't talk. It wasn't that she was hurt. So, um, it's interesting the way stuff keeps kind of getting revealed or implied, um, and it it keeps keeps your imagination turning as you're reading trying to yeah that's a out. that's a good point uh wild bow's not holding your hand here i mean you know he's he's spooling this stuff out uh need to know it doesn't seem like he's doing big information dumps is that fair to say exactly yeah i think that's a great way to characterize it um and that's a that's a mark of a great author is that you give enough information that somebody is curious and they want to keep going precise about just yeah spoon feeding them and and making it boring so it did it did for me uh you know as i'm uh, now uh full disclosure i i was doing the audio books and uh you know primarily was listening to this thing uh to and from work and then on long drives and so forth but uh as i was uh they're not audio books the auto recordings these guys did a good job conveying conveying the um wild bow's words and i wanted to to, i wanted to find out more um definitely each time there was you know he dole out a little bit of information i think to myself well this is pretty intriguing i wasn't expecting that uh okay where is this going this whole thing with arms master he um he approaches her with the idea of joining the wards which is the under 18 heroes of the protectorate earlier on we did get her description of the of the protectorate which is the local the local hero group and then they have these wards who work underneath them which i thought was pretty cool yeah i thought it was and it it makes sense right you're you're gonna you're gonna have different groups pop up in different areas uh and where the villains are bad you're gonna need to have a cluster of heroes um in some kind of governing body or whatever to try to you know keep things keep a balance uh so that areas aren't overrun um now i i do have a question for you did you ever like take the long way home or leave work leave home early so that you could listen longer in the car because (laughs) there was a particularly good part or uh no i wasn't that bad but there (laughs) there were there were times where i might sit there you know Okay, but, uh, but you know, soon as I ended up loading this thing onto my, uh, uh, I ended up getting iTunes, and so I'd listen to it at home more and more. And uh, we took a particularly long drive over uh, over the Labor Day weekend. It was a five hour drive up north, and and yeah, I put it on and and was listening to it the whole way. So, oh wow, I, yeah, I, I I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I, I was I was definitely hooked. I mean, when I started this thing, I thought, okay, maybe you know I'll do arc one and maybe arc two, and then I could say hey, I tried. But there was once I got past, I think to this point, I knew I was going to finish the whole thing. So, um, as one other thing that that uh, Arms Master does is he, after discussing the wards with her, kind of throw, throwing that out there. Uh, his next qu- big question was, who gets credit for lung? Yeah, and I thought it was interesting the way uh, Wild Bo kind of put these things in this order. Because, um, you know, given that Taylor has lost her best friend, high school is a drag, she doesn't really have anybody to interact with there. And then there's this kind of offer to join the wards. Um, I don't know if it's because of my background in team sports and stuff, but I would have jumped at that. I mean, I would have been like, oh, that sounds so cool. Thank you. This is what I wanted. Agreed. But but Taylor's reaction is who who wants to get involved with that drama and the pecking order again? And and this could just turn into exactly what I got. But with people with superpowers, which would be infinitely worse. I agree. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay, Uh, I would agree with you. I think that I would have that have the same response as you did but um seeing what taylor has gone through even though it was just a a, an early glimpse of some of the trauma i kind of you know nodded my head and say yeah 
okay, I think I can see it for this character, at least from what little bit. I understand her whys of not wanting to join the wards because of that potential drama. You know, why leave high school drama to go to a group of, you know, <laughs> superhero drama, superhero teenage drama? Why, why deal with that? I, I wasn't a fan of the decision, but I, I think I kind of understood it. Yeah, and I, I can see that. Um, it's, uh, I guess, and, and this, this might be a deeper thing that comes in later, but I think it's kind of a, an optimistic outlook versus a pessimistic outlook. So in my life, like I said, you know, I had friends, best friends, they move away, you know, dad's in the military or whatever, or right. they get a job somewhere else. And so I could have just said, all right, I'm going to be alone or whatever. But I felt like I had to keep trying to, to make, get in a group somewhere, get sure. connected, get new friends. And I think it's because I kind of have an optimistic outlook on life. And I think it's, it's part of it is from where you come from, right? You come right. from a family uh, that's fairly stable and things generally work out. So you kind of think things are going to work out uh -huh. on the other hand, hasn't really had that as we find out later. And, yeah. um, and I think that may have played into it, but I think, the way the author put the the words offer and then uh, arms master asking who gets credit for lung was interesting and kind of uh, validates Taylor's decision because it's like, well, if this guy who's supposed to be a superhero and defender of justice and everything, all of a sudden is like, Oh, I want to get the <laughs> right. Know, I, I want the credit for it for myself and I'll, I'll, I'll manipulate you or, or come up with a good reason why you shouldn't take it. If the drama is at that level with the adults, how much worse is it going to be with the teenagers? So all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, Taylor, you made the right choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I was uh, 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 again, I think also sharing that initial optimism. First of all, I'm glad that she recognized, you know, in the writing, she recognized, that he was playing her, you know, it, yeah. it, was, it was subtle, but, you know, Taylor saw it. And so that was kind of, I was like, you know, why are you going to do her like this? Okay. Well here, Taylor, um, join the wards where you'll have all this backup and protection, or, you know, you probably want to keep it low, stay on the down low because, you know, lung does have a couple of super powered flunkies who could come hurt you. So, you know, if you don't join the wards, you won't, you probably don't want to say anything about your involvement here. You know, it, it, what's she going to say? <laughs> of course, it's going to end up being, well, you know, keep my involvement out of it. I don't want nobody to know I was in this. You know, yeah. it was the, yeah. to her, in her eyes, it was an, the best scenario. Yeah. And I like the way Wild Bill characterized it as it was like she reluctantly said that. Yeah, you know, she she recognized that she would love to be part of the group. She that's her ultimate goal is to be part of the superhero community. Correct. But that uh, this wasn't the way to to get in there. Um, the other thing that I thought was uh, interesting here was that uh, well, just that Arms Master, like I said, was was wanting to take credit for it, and uh, you know kind of putting his own notoriety i guess hmm. over protecting like like that that would balance out like uh you know taylor's uh safety was equivalent to him getting uh, the kudos <laughs> and it's like well wait a minute that's not even close to being uh, but you know that's taylor taylor made the right decision as you said so yeah I did like uh, uh, going slightly back back in the in the chapter where uh, where she describes the the protectorate as an organization. Uh, it was the largest superhero organization uh, in the world, uh, spanning Canada and the U.S. And there were talks to include Mexico. So um, in this world that Wild Bo is constructing for us, capes are all over the planet. You know, and uh, and they have groups, um, you know, which you would expect people are going to team up uh, and fight for justice or scumbags are going to team up and, and try to get get there, so to speak. Uh, Arms Master is a, rem a member of the Protectorate East Northeast and the wards have the same uh, naming convention. 
Um, and she talks about uh, him having his own action figures, you know, and him being there in the in the the, the photo shoot with the, the classic V formation and stuff. I I liked that bit of world building there. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool, and it and it gets you thinking when he when he includes you know maybe Mexico. Mm-hmm. We're seeing if they want to get involved with the protectorate. It's like, well, yeah, how would that work with like national borders and politics and stuff? You know kind of along the lines of Watchmen, you know, where you've got uh, Dr. Manhattan and, uh, you know, right. What? how is that going to change the balance of power, if you will? Um, the other interesting point here, I thought, was where Arms Master mentioned that Long actually had two superpowered uh, lieutenants. Right. And uh, again, it's that kind of gap in the wiki, if you will. And it, it makes a neat vehicle that you figure is probably going to come up uh, periodically throughout the story but it's it's a great way for an author to be able to uh whet the reader's appetite but then also have a uh, plot twist that they can introduce right correct and the name of his uh his flunkies are oni lee and bakuda and taylor says she had heard of oni lee uh but she didn't know about bakuda and uh i want to find this information here and here's another piece of, of, of world building uh, where he we first find out about classifications for the various capes. Mm. Um, she, this uh, this Bakuda person, is a tinker, and um, and Taylor Arms Master asks her if she's familiar with what the tink- tinker classification is, and the, she says covers anyone with powers that gives them advanced grasps of science lets them make technology years ahead of its time. Ray guns, ice blasters, mechanized suits of armor, advanced computers. And so uh, Arms Master says that's close enough. And it turns out that this Bakuda person, uh, her specialty is bombs. And she conducted a bombing campaign, I believe. Oh, goodness. I forget what university it was, but it was- it might have been, and she held them hostage and conducted this bombing campaign there for like a, a, a week or a month or something. I think that comes up later on. Mm. So, so, uh, so there are classifications for these capes. Uh, everybody has a different specialty. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's interesting. I mean, it it kind of hinted at that uh, when the uh, Gru and his group showed up. Uh, that that at least you know one of them kind of was controlling these you know, animal dogs or whatever. And um, one of them seemed to have telepathic abilities. Uh, so you figure that, yeah, there is something, but it's interesting that they fall into categories, that there isn't kind of a a Superman, if you will, that seems to have a whole bunch of stuff. Although Long had a, a, a pretty wild array of abilities, you know, with the, the growth and the armor and super healing and the being able to have flame and then you find out also has super hearing because right he heard taylor crunch a little bit of gravel on the roof from two floors down and a block away so um yeah it'll be interesting to see how that builds out definitely and so that gets us through uh through chapter six and then we're, we're on to the interlude uh and each of these at the end of each arc, or sometimes during these arcs, there are going to be these interlude chapters. And this is our first one. I like how this one began. I mean, uh, there are, are TV shows and movies that use this device where, um, you know, we're starting out being told essentially what happened when the first Kate showed up on Earth. And then um, later on, we're basically we're pulling back from the television screen to reveal that Taylor's dad, Danny, is watching a documentary on the appearance of the first superhero named Zion. And I liked that. You know, you can almost just imagine the camera pulling back. And then next thing you know, we're sitting from Danny's POV and he's in his front room watching TV, or as the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, I really like this uh, mixing things in like this uh, periodically and to to reference Watchmen again. Um, They did that a lot through that uh, series in the graphic novel anyway, Uh where um, there'd be what the current 
situation was and then then thinking about what happened historically and then there was this other weird thread that came in every once in a while where you're like i don't know how this is connected to anything um but it uh it keeps you engaged because you uh you know where some of it's going and that's exciting but that other stuff you're not sure so then it's you're just your curiosity is, is peaked even more yes definitely and talks about how zion uh, uh first appeared um how he began uh periodically at first helping people and then eventually to where he's you know basically flying all over the planet uh trying to save people from disa- natural disasters and and then fighting criminals yeah excuse me let me read this one section just five years after Zion's first appearance the superheroes emerge from the cover of rumor and secrecy to show themselves to the public so Scion appears, and then after five years or so, the heroes begin to make themselves known to the world. So uh, you can just imagine what a, a wild time that had to be. Yeah, um, and uh, it, it's just kind of shocking, you know, because of the, where the story started with Taylor, you know, being bullied and then using powers, you kind of don't know any of the context. It's like, is she the only one? And then it it slowly expands, but tying it together in a neat little bow with this uh, interlude at the end where it's like, okay, they started a while ago. There was this one. Uh, and then it seemed like there were, they, they just started popping up everywhere. So uh, that, that, that fleshes it out a little bit more and gives you that backstory that kind of makes it all hang together better. Definitely a neat tool, definitely a neat way to do that. So it turns out that um, Danny is watching this thing. It's uh, the middle of the night, and he's awake because his daughter is not home. And he's a little worried. Yeah, I mean, he he really liked that she was trying to bounce back from the bullying at school. He doesn't really know all that's going on, but he knows it's, it's had a real impact on her. Um, and she's been going out and exercising to try to work through some things but he also knows that uh there's some pretty sketchy parts of town and so as a father you know he's worried about a teenage daughter being out on her own in in what could be a rough neighborhood so um when he he woke up from some movements in an old creaky house right and found his daughter gone then he's yeah he's got some some big time dad concerns yeah and uh you know you know, we both got boys, so, uh, you know, we're, we can appreciate it as parents, but, you know, a daughter would, I, I don't even want to think about how <laughs> my, personally, my skin would be, would be crawling, uh, having my daughter, uh, be missing in the middle of the night, but it turns out he's, he's been trying to, to walk a fine line between, uh, you know, smothering her with love as she's trying to come back and deal with the, this bullying and you know he doesn't want to be an absentee father not caring about uh, what's happening to his little girl yeah and and this also brings out that you know or, or at least explicitly states that he's a single parent that taylor uh doesn't have her mom around anymore that is correct and so um that that's a, a major juggling act and there's really nothing in the if there was a parent manual there's nothing in there that yeah uh talks about how to uh yeah love your child but also probe enough in their lives to help them if they need help um so yeah he's in a tough spot yeah and he as he's as he's you know waiting anxiously for her to return home he's thinking about it, all the drama she's been through um you know they wanted her to transfer from the current place uh, winslow high school to arcadia high school which is the it school for for kids to be uh and all he knows right now is it's the middle of the night she's out she's he's wondering if maybe the the bullies have blackmailed her or threatened her into making her come out at night and so forth and uh, and he's raging uh, against himself for not being able to help his daughter. And I think that kind of speaks to to this character. Uh, this guy loves his kid. He's just kind of, as you said, there's no parent manual for this kind of a situation. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know about your son. Our son didn't really go through any bullying per se, but there are definitely, you know, interpersonal conflicts that he had in, in high school. Agreed. And you don't want to jump in the middle of it. You know, conflict is part of life. So, but as a parent, you're like, wow, I wish there was something I could do. Um, and yeah. having, having my wife there to talk about it and have one or the other of us be the, the rational one in the conversation. Right. Um, I can't imagine trying to do it by myself. And like yeah. you said, with, with a daughter, that would have been, I couldn't have handled that. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> So so he is is waiting and then he hears her come back home and it's uh it's it's going on three if I if I recall correctly. It's it's late. And uh and he finally hears her um come back home. Um she's downstairs for a little bit and then she because he can hear her coming upstairs to head toward her room. Uh you know, he, he says, uh, Danny thought about clearing his throat to let her know he was awake and available should she knock on his door, but decided against it. Uh, Danny here is lost. He wants to do the right thing. But in this situation, he really doesn't uh, doesn't know what it is. A um, little further down here, it says that he smells he. Uh, he was going to go to her room, but uh, he could smell uh, toast and jam. And so he figured she just made herself a snack. So uh, that kind of gave him some relief. At least she, you know, might be okay. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that was really cool the way Wild Bo did that uh, because, yeah, I could totally picture him, you know, poised with his hand ready to knock on the door. Um and I was thinking, well, how is he not going to go in there? Um, and that would have taken things in a totally different direction. Uh, I mean, you kind of have that whole uh, childhood hero um, with a not out of touch parent or guardian, but at least someone who is trying to give the the, the kid space. Sure. And that's that that allows the kid to have that freedom to do whatever they're doing, you know, thinking of Peter Parker going off and, and doing his thing. Um, but uh, it's, um, I, there was part of me that really wished and it was just saying, man, you gotta, you gotta knock on the door. You gotta <laughs> at least say, Hey, I know that you weren't here. Yeah. Is and, everything, is everything okay? Do you, why were you out at this hour? Exactly. And, you know, we're going to talk more about this because that's that's not OK. <laughs> you got to have some kind of boundaries around this. But I totally the way the Wild Bo put that together with the toast thing and the, the whole dynamics that were already going on, I, I it was totally believable. And, and I could see the choice that he made and as, being something that would fit his character. I'm sorry. Yeah. And as we wind down here, the, the last part I liked here at the end of this interlude, it says uh, it took Danny a long time to calm down, helped by telling himself over and over that Taylor was OK, that she was home, and that she was safe. It's some, it was something of a blessing that as the anger faded, he felt drained. He climbed into the left side of the bed, leaving the right side empty out of habit. He'd not yet out of a habit he'd not yet break and pulled the covers up over himself. He talked to Taylor in the morning. So um, mom's not there. We don't know why. Um, and um, it's fair to say he, he misses her. He misses her. And uh, as you said, for a situation like this, especially not having that, having your, uh, your wife there to help talk you through it. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, another thing that, uh, really uh, resonated with me, I guess, because of my temper was how they talked about uh, Danny's temper. Mm, and yes. that, um, you know, he he had this continual struggle to want to be able to address things or to engage on things, but knowing that he could kind of go off at any time. And so, again, having a spouse there is, that's usually the person, you know, mine helps me to say, all right, Maybe you're, you know, winding up a little bit there. You sure. Dial it down. Agreed. Um, and so not having that uh, regulator, if you will, or safety mechanism um, 
makes him, I think, even more reluctant to 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 confront Taylor because he might do something and he and he's you know adamant about not wanting her to be exposed to his anger any more than she already has been. Yeah, yeah. Good writing. Uh good good writing, definitely. So with that, uh we conclude arc one, uh gestation. Um how'd you like it? Oh, it was like I said, it's uh even the beginning of it where it was kind of like uh you know one of those R.L. Stein <laughs> yeah. books um and you know teenage angst and that kind of thing yeah. I, somehow wild bow was already roping me in before right. any powers showed up or any yes. combat showed up or explosions any of the cool stuff that usually draws me in mm-hmm. um, yeah so, because yeah. when you, you you hear superhero story you go into this thinking one thing and you wild bow's like no we're going to take time we're going to develop characters here mm. yeah definitely yeah, this uh, this I, it started off great, um, and I'm really looking forward to going forward with it. Fantastic! All right, and as we begin to wind down, uh, we're Andy's going to uh, from time to time, he's going to be sharing with us folks uh, that he think are key characters for uh, for a given arc, um, whether hero or villain, cape or civilian. Uh, when he thinks somebody stands out, Andy's going to name them and, uh, for good or ill, tell us the, the whys and wherefores. So uh, in this arc, uh, Andy, did anybody in particular uh, stand out to you? And if so, uh, what were you thinking? Why? Well, she didn't play a big role in this, but I really am interested to see what happens with the hellhound slash bitch character. Uh-huh. Um she's kind of the only one that's got this dual designation. So there's this idea that, you know, people perceive her in different ways. Um, And then, uh, you know, it was her uh, animals, dogs, whatever they are, that, that kind of were the, the thing that, that completed the battle and allowed the, the uh, other group of villains to come and go. Um, and it's just, you know, up until that point, you you only had, everybody had powers that they were doing that, that were something only uh, of themselves, if you will. Ah. Except for Taylor, and she had the bugs. Now you've got some other character that's controlling uh, an outside uh, agent, if you will. Uh-huh. And so it's interesting to see. I thought that was cool that it, there's this mystery around that character, um, but a, there's some similarity there, and you wonder how that's yeah. going to play out. So that All right. was my, my really one that I thought was cool this time. Excellent. So uh, that's our, our key character for, uh, for this particular arc. Um, so as we're, uh, we're winding down here, um, I think we probably ought to let the folks know, um, you know, this is just a, a labor of love for us. We're not really sure what kind of a regular, if we're going to be able to do this on a regular schedule. Uh, we both work. Um, this is a tool, uh, an opportunity for us as a couple of old friends just to, to, to do like we used to do, sit in our apartment and, and discuss books or movies that we really did enjoy, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can remember, um, you know, even after college, coming back to visit uh, and, you know, I vividly remember you saying, well, we got to go see Terminator while you're here. Yeah. And us going to the theater and watching that and just being blown away and then talking for, yeah, I don't know, an hour or two afterwards about, oh, well, what about this? You know, how does that work? You know, I, and so uh, it's just so neat that we're getting back to that again years and years later. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a great amount of fun. Uh, as you said, we've got real life uh, that we deal with, uh, but uh, I'm really hoping this becomes uh, something we can do on a, on a regular schedule and, and uh, something I'm going to be, you know, counting down the days to each week to be able to uh, get together again and talk about it. Same here, my friend, same here. And so um, I think with that, we are going to uh, say so long to the folks and thank them very much. And we uh, say we hope to see them uh, next time. Yeah, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I think this is going to be a great ride going through Worm. 
Absolutely. Thanks for joining us in this video. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more information in the link down below. Catch you later.